We understand these, we begin to understand and unravel our emotions. Painful stuff. But because he puts so much emphasis on thoughts, then every thought we have really is, is and we'll talk about this, you know, is extremely important. And so s sort of putting ourselves in the right direction for whatever we do with the thoughts, with the motivation, with an intention is kind of important. It's in fact um, considered, you know, the main determining factor in Buddhist terms, the main determining factor uh, in the kind of the result to ourselves of what we do, say and think isn't so much in the action but is in the, where, the, where we're coming from, you know, where we're coming from, our intention, our motivation. So with this in mind, let's just set our motivation, start ourselves up, you know, point ourselves in the right direction for this day. So that, you know, in the most far-reaching thought, intention, motivation, you, it, it seems clear, is, is an altruistic one. So we all think, you know, think, okay, think. I'm sitting here listening to Buddha's ideas about the mind, life, how to work with ourselves, how to, you know, how to deal with the minefield of life. And so that certainly I can take some tools away so that I can develop my amazing potential. And Buddha says we have plenty of this. And indeed, so that in turn I can also be of benefit to others because we impact upon others all the time, don't we? So for our own sake and the sake of others, Let's listen to Buddhist ideas, Buddha's ideas, for this reason. So finally, the most altruistic is so that finally we can be of benefit to whoever hears us, sees us, touches us, you know, thinks about us, smells us, tastes us, all the little creatures coming and biting our flesh. Thinking like this, and just sing a little prayer that the second part of it expresses that. And for those of us who maybe think kind of identify already with being Buddhist, we can remind ourselves of our reliance upon the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha. Sangha cha dang so ke chong nam la chang cho ba du dag ni kyab su chi da gi cha nyen gi pe so nam ki dro la pen che sangha dro pa shog Sangha cha dang so ke chong nam la chang cho ba du dag ni kyab su chi da gi cha nyen gi pe so nam ki dro la pen che sangha dro pa shog Sangha cha dang so ke chong nam la chang cho ba du dag ni kyab su chi da gi chun yen gi pe so nam ki dro la pen che sang gi dro pa sho well you know buddhism can feel so complicated so esoteric sometimes actually it's definitely tibetan buddhism and it's mind boggling you know but when we strip it all down, strip it down, strip it down, which is what we absolutely must do in order to find the essence of what it's all about, it's not just the packaging, then we're going to find that it's very, in one sense, simple. It's about the mind. It's about what you think and feel. And as Lama Zobar Rinpoche puts it, that's where the workshop is. So a person who's a Buddhist practitioner, to whatever degree, you know, and remember always you can be a 1% Buddhist, it's not a problem. A person who is a Buddhist practitioner, to whatever degree, is a person who deals with their mind. And Buddha would say that is the source of happiness. And indeed, the extent to which we don't deal with our mind is the, is the extent of our suffering. Because in Buddhist terms, everything really does come down to the mind. And that's not meant, it sort of sounds like a bit cliched, but the more we understand the big picture in Buddhism, the more we understand Buddha's whole deal, the more we can see this is very simply correct you know this is how buddha says it and this take very much to do with this is this like buddha's whole view of the in the big picture uh, uh, that doesn't include the idea of a creator you know it all, all it, it reinforces it comes down to it affirms the buddhist emphasis on the mind so the mind what it means whether you know whether you think it's your brain or not doesn't matter buddha would say it ain't your brain what it means is what you think. Your mind is just the name we give to the process, isn't it, of thoughts and feelings and emotions. That's it, you know. So that's what we have to learn to get in touch with. Being our own therapist, Lama Yeshi would say, it sort of sounds pretty cute, but it's, it's profoundly true. So the words are simple. These words are really easy. This is not complicated. But, so why is it so difficult? 
Well, all sorts of reasons, but in, in a very obvious way, the one reason it's difficult to get in touch with what we think and feel and then to begin to work with this stuff and transform it is because we're so caught up in lots of other things. And that one of the major things we're caught up in is everybody else's thoughts and feelings, everybody else's body and the things out there. And simply speaking, we give power to all of that far more than we do to our own, to, to this position in here. We just think, you know, we, we, in fact, you look at us, we think, we act like and feel like a victim of circumstances. We, you know, even the fact that we didn't get out, well, I didn't ask to get born, did I, we think. We really have a, it's actually a belief system, the, the other religions or the, or the Western view, the materialist view, it's a belief system that you got made by someone else. Buddha thinks that's ridiculous, you know. Really, he just, he's, you know, the, the whole idea of what mind is, and we look at the big picture again, the one of karma, we bring our mind with us, he says. Our consciousness is ours, it's not this physical thing. So everything that's even in there from the second we're conceived until the, from, the time, from the second we pop out of our mother's womb, you know. Since we can remember all of that, that's our own mind, it's ours, no one made us. We put ourselves here, Buddha says. So even just hearing that's kind of interesting. But the implication of that right now is that what is in here, in Buddhist terms, is is the source of my suffering and the source of my happiness. It is not the other person, it is not the weather, it is not the food, it is not George Bush, it is not the politics, it's not anything out there that is the main cause. This is the crucial point. Again, even if we don't go deeply into the, the teachings on karma, which is where all this is articulated, laid out, explained, the thing to get, to begin to understand, and it's very empowering, this is the point, is that what is, it, what is occurring inside me determines, is the main determining factor in my happiness and suffering. I mean, that's quite a potent idea, you know. And it's not what we believe right now. We really believe it is everybody else that is the reason I'm happy, the reason I'm suffering. It's just, it's, you know, and it's, it's not just something that's taught to us and it's not just something that is the basis of the way this world works, but it seems intuitive within us, doesn't it? Therefore, it seems the truth. It seems the truth. And that's why it is so difficult. The words are simple, that what occurs in here is the main thing. But why it is difficult to believe it, basically, to actually give credibility to that, and therefore to act upon it, is because everything else seems so real. And Buddha would say it's because we've practiced the other view to perfection. We've brainwashed ourselves, he would say, in the other view, in the view that everything out there is the source of my suffering. Everything out there should change, then I'll be happy. Everything out there should change, then I'll not suffer. I mean, you check our lives, you check everybody's experiences, you check the way we talk, you check everything. This is just assumed. And this, is what, this assumption is what Buddha argues with. So like I said, the words are easy, but when it's, when it's fighting a, a, an instinctive assumption, that's what makes it difficult. So the way the model of the mind, if you like, Buddha's model of the mind, it's interesting. There's, it's, you know, he talks about, on the one hand, we have very, it's quite, again, seemingly simple, right? The components of this consciousness, this mind of ours, this personality, if you like, the word personality is simply another word for, what, for your thoughts and feelings. That's all. That's all it is, right? You think about it. Your tendencies, in, internally, your internal tendencies. So a simple way to look at the components of these in Buddhist terms, you've got positive, negative, and in, in neutral states of mind or tendencies, thoughts, feelings. Positive, negative, and neutral. It's very simple. We could think it's simplistic because we make it so complicated in all our various psychological models in the West. We give all these endless names and new ones are being invented every day. But it comes down to it, you know. In Buddhist terms, you've got the positive, the negative, and the neutral. The simple function of the positive ones is that they're the source of your happiness. The extent to which you have love and kindness and happiness and joy and contentment and fulfillment and, ben and, 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 and generosity and patience, all the positive states of mind, we all know those words. And we all know, we recognize them as good. When we hear those, when we know they're in here or when we get them from other people, we recognize them immediately. That's good. We hear about a generous person and we think, oh, isn't that nice? We hear about a person who's kind of, you know, fairly content. Isn't that nice? We don't think, how revolting, you know. I don't want that. Then we hear the other words, very simple again, really. Anger, jealous, fear, depressed, angry, resentful, bitter, low self-esteem. We know they're the horrible ones. We just know it instantly. So this is, where, this is what Buddha talks. This is what he's dealing with. It's as simple as this. 
So clearly, if then the negative ones are the source of our suffering and the source of why we harm others, and let's face it, we, can, we know that pretty much, then clearly we have to identify them and then work with them. Because Buddha would say they're not at the core of our being. This is a crucial point. It's sort of Buddhist philosophy, but don't hear it as something rarefied in the sky that you have to learn just to learn, you know. It's some, it has very profound experiential implication, which is the point of all of this stuff. The negative qualities are the ones that are painful, you know, that are just the having of them is the source of our pain. Therefore, the source of why we um, harm others, you know. When you're profoundly depressed, you're not much use to others, are you? When you're very angry, you know, you're, you're harmful to others. But the first thing to recognize, and in the wisdom wing and the compassion wing, these two wings that Buddha says a bird needs, wisdom and compassion, the wisdom wing is, when you, is what we're talking here, working with yourself, putting yourself together. Then you can be of benefit to others. So this model of, his, of the mind, simple, fairly simple. The, 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 one of the terms Buddhism uses for these negative states of mind, interestingly enough, is the word delusion. And we've talked about this many times. The word delusion, which is kind of very precise. The word delusional, Buddha says. And so one of the functions of these unhappy states of mind, and I think it's not too difficult to see this and we'll talk about it. One of the functions of the unhappy states of mind, the negative states of mind, is to cause us literally to be out of touch with reality. Quite simply, for that five minutes that you're angry, for that 10 days that you're depressed, you're not in touch with how things really are. And we can sort of see this, but it's, it's got a very strong truth to it. The more you're angry, the more crazy, the more delusional you are, the more you're convinced, you're more paranoid, aren't you? You're paranoid, you see all these monsters out there, you believe he's really this horrible person who really did do that thing, who is the cause of your suffering. And you know 10 minutes later when you calm your anger down, you're a little bit embarrassed about the big song and dance. When you're when you suddenly the depression, if it does, and some of us have it lifelong, let's say when the depression suddenly lifts, oh, it's like a new day, isn't it? Things look different, you know? Wow, look at that. That's a really clear indication of this, this quality of delusional. I mean, we'd be insulted if someone said, you know, you're delusional. We would be very hurt. But this is really the point that Buddha's making, psychologically speaking. And this is, one of the, this is the source of the suffering and pain. And Buddha would go very deeply into describing this delusional characteristic, the function of this. So the root delusion as this little model talks about, the root delusion, the mother of them all, the source of all the others, is it, the Buddha calls it ignorance. In Tibetan, ma rigpa, unawareness. The ma is the negative, rigpa is awareness. So this, it's like a primordial, constant, instinctive, unawareness, ignorance of how things really are, who I really am. And, and again, in Buddhist terms, that's quite specific, this this ignorance. But speaking colloquially about it, it's known as ego grasping, self grasping. And, and it, the, the, the way it causes us to feel, because it's there all the time, it's beneath everything we ever think and feel, even the positive thoughts and, and feelings. It's constantly there, sometimes very loud, sometimes, most of the time just assumed. Therefore, extremely hard to see. So its function is, is this one of um, grasping. So, you know, when someone, insult, when, it's, when someone insults you or hurts you or something f shocking happens, that fear that arises, right, that panic and fear, that's the symptom, the symptom of this ego grasping. They say it's, its function is to be fearful. It's the function of this ignorance. So we, you know, we understand about fear. So we know if the depression is very strong or the anger is very strong or the, whatever it might be, if you really begin to analyse it, which we need to do, being our own therapist, we're going to recognise, and this just takes time, because you know, we're talking at quite a sensitive level of, your, of awareness of your own being. You're going to recognise this fear. It's just there all the time. It's assumed. And, the, and another way of describing how this fear functions is in terms of there's this little me here and all them out there, you know. 
And the more strong the, de the other delusions, the attachment, anger, depression, anxiety, jealousy, you name it, the more strong they are, the s naturally the stronger this fear, you know, the stronger this sense of this I, this grasping at I, and this sense of separateness from others. These are very key things in Buddhist terms, you know. This, we're being very precise here. In the same way that when we talk math, you're not just being wishy-washy, you're being precise. You've got to know what's seven, what's two, what's five, what's multiplied, what's subtract. That kind of precision is, is the type of precision that Buddha uses in this type of discussion, which is unusual because we don't think like this in the West. We think of it as very spacious and la di da, you know, and everybody can think whatever they like about all these things. But the Buddha's view is that very precise. Each word I'm using here is like math, in the sense that it has a clear definition, has a clear function, and the, this is the basis, this kind of clarity, this understanding is the basis of one's being, one's own therapist, and one's capacity to change oneself. So the function, the root delusion is this ignorance. It's e known as ego grasping. It, it, it's, the, it's the fear, you know, so what it brings when it's strong, we, when we notice it, is a very tangible sense of fear, you know. Whether it's fear of what people think or fear of the dark, fear of the unknown, fear of, lack of not having somebody. I mean, you name it, you know, we've all got our own trip. Fear is fear is fear, but we dump it on different things. We label ours in a particular way, don't we? And so, of course, all this stuff, we just assume, well, this is normal. This is just life, you know. And so we kind of think, well, I'm normal. And as long as it's not out of hand, then I'm an okay human being. So almost like our baseline, if you like, is pretty, is pretty gross in Buddha's terms. Our baseline in Buddha's terms is, is insanity. Because he says we're all pretty insane. And we use that term in the West. He didn't have that term then. But this is exactly what Buddha is saying, that, that the, the very having of this ego grasping which defines us virtually at the moment as a sentient being. And therefore the having of the voices of this ego grasping, which are the other delusions, attachment, anger, pride, jealousy, depression, you name it, that just the having of these, which we think, oh, it's normal, he says, excuse me, it is normal insofar as we've all got them, but his view is that they are completely unnatural they do not belong, and we can get rid of them. This is the point that Buddha is making. So you go, you become your own therapist in Buddhism. You're, you're, what you're trying to do is get rid of all the junk, get rid of all the yoga grasping, all the anger, all the pride, all the jealousy, all the depression. Doesn't matter how long it takes. But this is your goal. So you know, if you go to your therapist now and say you'd like to do that, they they think you're a, you know, they think you're completely insane and put you on a pill. You know, you're a megalomaniac. Don't be unrealistic, they'll say. That's insane. You know, you're, you're completely out of, your, out of your head. But this, hear the words. This is the point that Buddha is making. So the word nirvana, you know, cutie, lovely heaven somewhere. No, no. The, re the removing of all this junk, that's what nirvana is. That's what he means. Is he uses that word, you know. The trouble is for us, hearing Buddhism, because it's couched in religious terms, it's, ter it's known as a spiritual path. And because in our culture over the centuries we've totally separated psychology, philosophy, spiritual, haven't we? They're completely separate things now. So we've split them up in our heads. Well, for the Buddhist approach there is no contradiction between philosophy, psychology, religion, way of life. They all are various, just different ways of seeing the one integrated package, you know. This is definitely the Buddhist view. So the, the job of being a spiritual practitioner in Buddhist terms, the job of being a religious practitioner, you name it, is to do this job. Why a person goes off, let's say, to be a meditator sitting in the mountains for 30 years, why a person goes off and decides to become a monastic, it's not just to sit there looking holy with your hands like this looking at Buddha, you know, being religious as we vaguely think, is to be your own therapist. It's to know deeply your own mind. Why you go off to the mountains for 30 years isn't just to have a vision of God. They don't talk like that. It's to completely unravel, completely unravel to the subtlest degree this mind of ours, totally ridding it of the nonsense, thus discovering the qualities of the clarity of the mind, the natural innate clarity. Hear the words accurately, not as some trip. Clarity, wisdom, joy, love, you name it. 
So just hearing this, it's quite empowering. It's quite amazing, you know. And once we can have some confidence in this process, then no matter how long it takes, it doesn't matter because once you're on track, you don't care. You know, you know when you're five years old, it's going to take you 20 years to come, end up like Michael Jordan. Well, he's probably retired by now. I don't know who the latest one is. Who does, who's, the, who's your synonym of basketball these days? LeBron James and Kobe Bryant. Kobe, okay. He's become a good boy now, has he? <laughs> <laughs> I thought he was, an he was used as an analogy for, for naughty boys. Okay, Kobe Bryant, okay. <laughs> so it's going to take, you know, one, the thing is, once something, once you know you're on track, once you know you've got the right method, whether it's making a cake or becoming a Buddha, once you know you've got the method, then you've got some kind of patience, haven't you? So why we're mostly in a state of panic? Because we don't think we're on the right track. And, it's sort of, and we think that happiness is hit and miss. We don't think there are methods for getting happy. We don't think there are methods for, getting, for suffering less. We know there are methods for making cakes and becoming like Kobe Bryant. And we know it takes time. So we're prepared to be patient and have long-term view and keep our eye on the goal. But in normal worldly terms, we don't have this view when it comes to happiness and suffering. It's just like hit and miss, isn't it? So the Buddha would really say we, our minds are riddled with a whole lot of misconceptions. He's disagreeing with so many of the assumptions we all take as the truth in this materialist world of ours. So, you know, if we, it's worth listening at least to what he says and then giving it, you know, thinking about it to see if there's something reasonable in it. And then... You know, say so if one does make a commitment to oneself, you know, to use Buddha's methods to help yourself get happy and be of benefit to others, then you 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 begin to calm down. You know, you begin to kind of recognize your junk, recognize yeah, you're full of delusion, you're depressed, you're angry, you've got all this rubbish. But hey, it's cool. I'm working on it. You know, just like when you're five, you can't hardly pick up a ball. Forget about sticking it in the hoop. Because you have the picture in your head of being like that in the future, you've got, you're on track, you're prepared to you know, work for it. But when you just think it's hit and miss and there's no method, of course you're in a state of panic. You see the point I'm making? So fear, it doesn't matter what you label it, whether it's you know, fear of height or fear of what your mother thinks, doesn't matter, you know. We all recognize fear. We use it in a very broad way. But in Buddhist terms, it is the function of, of this primordial ego grasping, which is the defining characteristic of what Buddha would say of being in samsara, which is the exact opposite of being in nirvana. Again, these aren't places. Like we think of nirvana as this holy place where you've got to, where you've got to go, and, and to get there, you've got to give up sex, drugs, and rock and roll. How depressing, you know. It's such a cliched view we have. It's unbelievable. Like I said, nirvana is, just, simply speaking, okay, is a term used to refer to the mind of the person who's done the job of ridding, of ridding, up, ridding the junk. You know. Samsara is a word that refers to the mind of the person who's caught up in the junk. Well, you know, join the club. That's us. So we're in samsara. It means we're caught up in the rubbish. It means we have our mind. Specifically, it means that we have this ego grasping, this ignorance. It's what defines us, you know, in Buddhist terms. It's what defines a suffering being, whether you're a dog, a giraffe, or a human. You're a sansaric, sentient being. So, and it's fear is its function, fear. So then the voices of this ignorance, like, or the, you know, if it's the root delusion, then the branches the natural manifestation of this ignorance, this primordial grasping, and we'll talk more about its characteristics later. The branches, they are all the other unhappy states of mind we have. The main one of which is called attachment, which again we will describe. And then the, from this, anger, depression, jealousy, low self-esteem. They're all variations. They're all variations, you know. They're all variations of, uh, of this, um, or they're, fun they're, they're coming out of this attachment, which in turn comes from the root, this primordial ignorance, this primordial sense of a separate me-ness as opposed to you-ness, which itself is, in Buddhist terms, and again not being cosmic about it, is 
the main function of the one of the main functions of the ignorance the opposite being that when you've given up this ignorance when you've achieved even to some degree the giving up of this ignorance lessened it even to some extent it's to that extent that you have a connectedness with others and this is a very clear point i mean buddha talks about how like i said we're delusional so which means we're not in touch with reality. So in Buddha's terms, what is, that, what is reality? Well, in reality, Buddha would say, one way he talks about how things do exist is that things exist interdependently. And we can talk about this. But one clear way that that functions experientially when we're in touch with that is having a sense of connectedness with others. Now you check this, it's very simple. If Lynn and I are sitting here chatting away to ourselves and we're each listening to the other person and being friendly and kind, there's a sense of connectedness, isn't there? There's a sense of we, of friendliness, and you're, and you're kind of peaceful, and there's a sense of harmony. Don't you agree? Now watch what happens when we start arguing. And she gets angry, and I get up hurt, and she... Suddenly, there's a vivid sense of separateness, isn't there? She's way over there, and you are freaking out in here, she this and she that, it's not fair, and I this and I that, and how dare she, and the tears come. We all recognize this. Well, when you're caught up in those, there's a real sense of separateness, isn't there, of me and her. Well, that's samsara. That's the function of the, all the delusions, to whatever extent, is to, is to they're, they're, it's a, it, they're a symptom of the vivid sense of I, or as Lama Yeshi puts it, the self-pity I, the poor me. That's the way ego grasping works. It's a vivid sense of me-ness, and in its nature, it's delusional. In its nature, it's not happy. When we're connected, you know you're I, you're not stupid, you're not, you know you're not Fred, and you know you're not Lynn, you know you are Rabina, but when your sense of connectedness, which is coming when you have the virtuous, positive states of mind prevalent, kindness and friendliness and all that, you know, just ordinary old stuff, then, then you ask, there is a sense of connectedness, isn't there, of interdependence. Well, that is, Buddha says, how things do exist anyway. They are like that. Things are actually like that. But when you're in the with the delusions, you're not in touch with that connectedness. There's a sense of separateness. And he says, that's mistaken. Things aren't separate. I mean, these are a peculiar word for us, and we, for words for us, and we can easily make them mystical. Don't hear them as mystical, please. We're talking accuracy here, actual, real. So when a person is even, like I said, to some extent, you know, uh, to some extent, when a person is, um, is, is, has practiced, <coughs> practiced in the positive qualities and practiced in not feeding into the negative ones, even to some extent, one of the symptoms is in your life more steady, more harmonious, less separate from others, therefore less lonely therefore less depressed, therefore less angry, less jealous. This is practice. This is how it works, you know. So all of it. So even for a Buddhist who's sitting there doing all your holy things day and night, the reason to do all those is to help you do this job. The methods, you know, the methods of doing all what seem to be all these religious things, those methods aren't, have, don't have some unique kind of special religious characteristic, they are simply methods you're using to help you get the ball in the hoop. You know, if you go to Kobe Bryant, hey man, tell me how to get the ball in the hoop. It's the bottom line of basketball, isn't it? And he'll say, well, go off for five years and do the jogging and go on this special fast and this special diet and don't have sex for six weeks and before you have a match or whatever they say, right? And do this and don't do that. You'll say, no, 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 you didn't hear me, Kobe. How do I get the ball in the hoop? And he'll repeat his answer, won't he? Because you can't just walk up and stick the ball in the hoop. You've got to do all these other things to enable you to have the skill to get it in every time, right? Well, that's the same here. All the things you do as a Buddhist, quote unquote, all the seemingly religious things and the holy ones and the mantras and the this and the that, they're all ways to help you do the job of lessening your delusions and increasing your positive qualities. It comes down to that. That's the bottom line of being a Buddhist. When we understand that, then we understand the function of the various practices and so we can be very skillful in selecting which practices we need to do today. Well, I better do more jogging, you know. Better do this more today because you know what you need to do. The bottom line 
is changing your mind. That's it. That is the actual job. So we need, because Buddha's saying we're totally brainwashed in not doing this job and we're completely caught up in all the other wrong ways of seeing things, we need to do an awful lot of push-ups, an awful lot of jogging to prime our minds to develop these new habits, you know, of, uh, of changing the way you see things, of changing, getting rid of the neurotic delusions and developing the positive qualities. This is it, you know. So you've got to have long-term view. I mean, and this is what we don't have, because I said we're sort of thinking like life is just a, 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 a something that is just random. Someone plonked me here, cut me out with their cookie cutter, you know, nothing to do with me. Already we begin life as a victim, automatically. We assume, it's, like I said, it's even the belief system in this culture that someone else made you. And we, we, almost it seems puzzling to think that someone didn't make us because we're so believing that's true. Whether you're religious or materialist, someone else made you. It's either God or your mum and dad, isn't it? Buddha says they didn't. You made you, he says. You made you. You brought your own characteristics with you. So this is a leap for most of us, maybe, the idea that my consciousness and my mind existed before I was in my mother's womb. It sounds pretty cosmic. But you know, all of Buddha's big picture view is all based on this assumption. So you take it as a hypothesis. You don't have to believe it, swallow it whole, you know. You take it as a hypothesis. But the implication of that is that what's in here is yours and therefore that you can change it. This is the point, you know. When you've got this in your mind, you get some confidence to bear the pain. So, you know, in, 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 um, so, what, you know, so then one of the approaches in Buddhist terms to dealing with the suffering that occurs, like the depression, the fears and so on, the anger, whatever it might be. There are various approaches, okay? One approach is you deal with the very thing itself, looking into it deeply, understanding it, unraveling it, understanding how it functions, understanding its nature very well. That's necessary, very necessary. It's like you've got a cancer in here. You have to know how it functions. You've got to open it up and look at it and understand the way it works, you know? But there are other ways of working as well. You've got to, you know, by going on a decent diet. You, you can help the cancer. You're not dealing directly by looking at the cancer, are you? But you know it will help. Well, the same here. There are various ways of dealing with your mind, being your own therapist. One is definitely becoming very, being very analytical through utilizing skillful concentration techniques, which are just skillful, you know, uh, psychological techniques, training your mind to be very focused, you then can learn to really begin to unravel by being your own therapist, unraveling what is going on and understanding the nature of depression, the nature of the fears, the nature of the anger. This is crucial, necessary. That's one approach and necessary and we'll talk about this. But another approach is very interesting. This other, another approach is understanding how to, how to, how to interpret it. And this is a very simple thing. So let's say, you know, you're all floppy and overweight and you want to go and turn it, you want to turn into, you want to look like Arnold Schwarzenegger, let's say. All right? You want to have big, you know, lovely muscles. Now, you know perfectly well when you start at the gym, because someone says, you know, you can look, you turn, you can look like Arnold Schwarzenegger, Rabin, you're gonna look, you can look great, you know. Go to the gym, do this, do that. And you go to the gym and you do this and do that, you're not going to look like Arnie overnight. In fact, you're going to come home and you'll be exhausted, right? The pain will be incredible. You, you understand my point? Very simple point. Now, because you know that it takes time and because you know that the, that pain is an indicator, isn't it, of the, of, of, it's a good sign, isn't it? It's an indicator of your beginning to change your muscles. We understand this really comfortably. You know, you can come home looking all hot and, and the blood ra ra rising in you and you look panting and puffing and aching and you hop in the bath and, and someone else, and you'll groan about the pain, but you'll, you'll, your face will look happy. Are you hearing my point here? You really will be glad because you know how to interpret the pain. But now look how you feel when you have depression, anger. Are you in the bath looking, you know, oh, phew, I had a hard day today, but I'm really blissful, you know, this depression is incredible. <laughs> you hear my point here? We don't say that, do we? We do not say that. And the Buddha would say, because we don't know how to interpret it. And I'm not joking here. Lama Zopa said one time, and he says things like this all the time, he said, depression, depression is just depression. It's a delusion. But when it manifests in the context of practice, going to the gym, working on your mind, then it is in fact a sign of purification. 
Now that, you know, we can say, oh yeah, thanks a lot. Meanwhile, I'm so miserable, I'm so depressed. Because we don't know how to interpret it. And it takes courage, right, to even begin to think this. Why? Because right now we are absorbed in the belief this is bad, isn't it? Whatever it might be, whether it's the anger, depression, you name it. We all know these things really well. So almost like you can say, it's bad enough you've got depression, but the killer is the way you think about it. And I'm not joking here. This is really deadly serious and this is an amazing skill to develop that does demand courage because the irony of being caught up in our delusions is, as Lama Yeshi put it, that's the self-pity me. It's like we run like a magnet to the self-pity me. We, we, we are completely absorbed in our anger and our fears and our jealousy and our depression. And don't, I'm not trying to be mean about us, but recognize that. We go like a magnet to it and we identify, this is me. Right? So really, it's the way we identify with it that is the source of the suffering. But this just takes time, and it does demand a lot of time and a lot of inner clarity and inner analysis. Another, another way to say that too, it demands a new way to interpret what arises in us. This is being your own therapist. We need a lot of clarity a lot of courage because you know again from the big picture point of view just to take this you know as our hypothesis a lot of the stuff that arises in our mind right now is not because of any particular thing that occurred right now and you can prove that you wake up one morning nothing particular has changed today but suddenly you can't believe the depression or the anger or the dissatisfaction overnight you suddenly something has come you, you think what on earth have I done that's different nothing at all so the Buddhist explanation of this is that it's because our consciousness, think of it as this river of mental moments that goes back and back and back and back and back before mummy and daddy. This is the fundamental Buddhist view. Consciousness is not physical. It's not coming from mummy, daddy, God or someone else. It is not random events. Everything that arises in our mind is like fruits, you know, of seeds that were planted in that mind before, before, before. So whether it is in terms of since a little kid you've got this tendency to stomp on the snails, your mummy didn't teach you, well where did that come from? You know, Not out of the sky because you brought with you in your mind, in your consciousness from past practice of it, a tendency to harm. I remember even, you know, I remember reading one of the, about Jeffrey Dahmer years ago, that serial killer years ago, and he was interviewed in a film and he said since a little boy he remembers it's strong, instinctive um, wish to harm creatures, to torture them and harm them. Now in the West, because we, don't, we have no answers for this in the West, right? No, and no one has begun to contemplate where this comes from. Because if you, and Buddha's view is because if you assume that Jeffrey Dahmer, let's say two years old, the two years and one day or one second before that, he didn't exist. He didn't, there was nothing about Jeffrey Dahmer that existed. And that is the view, if you have the materialist view. And excuse me, that's also the view, if you have the view that God made you. There's nothing about that person that existed before God created you or before mummy and daddy did their thing. The Buddha disagrees with this. And to even hear as an explanation for why we have these seemingly random rising of things inside us, it's, it's helpful at least as an explanation. Don't have to swallow it take it as a hypothesis. But the Buddha's explanation is that from the first second of conception you come as a, as a package already. All the imprints in your mind, the tendencies are there, you know. Many, many causes and conditions that bring it about but the, the simplest way to think about it is that your consciousness is a river of mental moments that goes back and back and back and back and back. And so in day-to-day -day way what arises seemingly randomly is a seed that was planted who knows when that now the time has come and it suddenly popped up and it's called depression, it's called anger, it's called, you know, I can't, you know, whatever it's called. Or the happy ones too, the same thing, same thing. You wake up one morning and you're depressed for six weeks and suddenly the, everything's cleared, finished. You don't know why. It seems random, right? Well, the Buddha's explanation, I mean, it goes into quite deeply from the point of view of karma, but just to even take it as an idea. 
at least, it's, at least you know, it's an explanation for why you have these seemingly random risings of so-called happy or unhappy experiences, you know. It's the, it's, the, it's the seed was planted in the past and then it ripens now in the present. So one of the skills we need to develop in this job of being our own therapist is to be watching what is coming in the mind. Watching. It's my mind, you know. I've got to know it really well. And this is part of the problem too. In our culture we don't think like this. We just take this assumption that I'm made this way and I'm just plonked on this earth and you just got to do your best. And so, you know, when it gets that bad, you better go find a therapist, you know. We don't even look at our mind until something goes wrong. That's really pretty gross. We don't, we don't, we understand very well in the Western world, you don't, if you treat everything this way, you're going to be in big trouble. If you assume your car will work until it goes wrong, you're in big trouble. But we understand you have to be aware of what's going on and then you maintain it. You have to be familiar with it a little bit and how much gas is there and how much this. We understand this when it comes to everything. When it comes to our body and health, we're intelligent, you know. We understand the future. We understand the consequences of our actions. If I eat rubbish now, I'll get sick later. This is not a problem for our mind. But, but, but when it comes to emotional stuff, we don't apply the same logic. But that is the logic Buddha applies to the emotions. Just as you know, if one day suddenly, you know, you start, you know, getting something in your face or you get pain in your abdomen. You can often trace it down to the food you've eaten or the way you haven't done this or that. You can trace it, you know. So because of this we learn and so we, we adjust our behaviour. We change the way we are to stop that future symptom. Well, that's the approach in psychological terms. So, okay, the, the one thing I'm saying here is that what arises in our mind, in our emotions, isn't necessarily due to something you did yesterday. So depression is a very classical example, a classical example of this kind of thing. It can be the strong ripening of some past karma, you know, that has nothing to do with your present life. So, so therefore, the way to see it, and of course it is difficult because the impulse is to identify me with that I am depressed. We become completely absorbed in it, right? We believe it's true. We believe this is me. This is everything. And we see everything through that filter. Well, this is why, that, it's sort of like, that's, that's bad enough. And then almost like you get depressed about that. But if we can have the skill to recognize it, not identify I with it, because Buddha would say it is not at the core of your being. It's just the ripening of some junk. So, like you watch it real carefully. It's like a pain in your knee. If you're really skillful, you don't walk around every day having mental breakdown, identifying yourself as a complete wreck because you've got a pain in your knee. But if you know it's just, it's just something that's there, you learn to deal with it, you learn to adjust to it, you don't have to tell everybody about it every two minutes, and you just learn to live with it. You have a skillful attitude towards it. That's the same here. Because sometimes it's just the, the, very, the very seeing it in this way actually is a powerful method for finishing it. It's got, it's got its own life. It's got its own run, you know. There's a certain amount of gas in the tank and you allow it to run itself out. And, by do, and having this attitude already can help lessen, helps lessen the pain of it, keeps you afloat. You learn to live with the pain because it's just how it is. And you just continue your life. You keep on track with your life. You don't get thrown by this depression. It's difficult, I'm not saying it's not, but this is the approach, you know, one of the approaches. And then slowly, slowly, because it's impermanent, it's a certain, you put a certain amount of gas in, you're going to get a certain amount of mileage, aren't you? And every day you live, you keep driving and driving, you know your tank's getting less and less. Well, the tank of your depression will lessen and eventually will run out, which is why one day you'll wake up and it's all gone. Oh, wow, look at this, life is normal again. Because the tank ran out, your depression finished. So you can say that... How, you know, the, the, the suffering of the depression is bad enough. The suffering of the knee is, is a hassle, you know, it's a pain. But the identifying with it and the moaning about it, I'm not being mean about it, please, it's tough. But the over-exaggerating of it, the absorption into it, the going on and on and on about it, it's like it builds it up. And that anxiety and those fears and that uh, uh, unhappiness, this increases and bring that pain and then brings more pain. Because in Buddhist terms, m the way we see things, which is our mind, is totally intimately connected to the body. We can see this all the time ourselves. 
a person who's got a more happy attitude towards things, doesn't suffer so much. When you're anxious, your body is more tight, therefore you cause pain in your body. When you're not anxious, you're more relaxed, therefore the body is more relaxed. It's sort of so logical, it's, it's embarrassing, really, the relationship between mind and body. So the one point I'm saying here, one technique, if you like, because all these are techniques, they're ways of seeing things, because we're talking psychological techniques, is to interpret the depression, or whatever it might be, in this way. So in other words, another way to say it is learning to identify it and then to separate, if you like, the positive me from it. Not living in denial of it, but not identifying with it. This is a huge one because this one of identifying with it, this is the function of ego. So the same thing when things go well. When there's no pain, no depression. Wow, I'm so happy at last. Life is so happy. And what you do is you grasp at it. You identify it as the truth. And then what happens when it changes? Because it will, because that's the nature of samsara. You become devastated. So whatever it is, whether it's happy or suffering, we identify with it and we grasp at it and we see it as permanent. Therefore, we don't think it's going to change and we frantically, like a junkie, depend upon it. So if it's the happy one, we get completely hysterical and overexcited. And then when it's the bad one, we get completely, you know, the down part of the bipolar, we want to go kill ourselves. Do you see? So we've got these wildly extreme up and down responses to what is arising in our mind, in our life every day. So learning to understand this and attempting to apply this approach to life, which takes practice, is already an amazing way to be stable in our life, you know, to keep some kind of control, to understand what's going on, and to live our life more whole, you know. And we can say here, in, in this way we cling to the up and cling to the down, this is the function of attachment. Because all these delusions are all working beautifully together in this integrated package called the neurotic eye. You know, they've all got their jobs and they all do their jobs really well. So attachment, this cute, simple word, is very similar in character to the grasping that we're talking about, this primordial ego grasping, which is the very basis of all the suffering. The attachment is the main voice of this grasping, and again, it's almost at the level of assumption. And it's this addiction to getting, a, to, having, to having nice, to having, to everything being nice. Now, I'm not talking about the reasonable human, you know, attitude to want nice things. That can be a virtuous way to see it, but we're talking the deluded way now. And it's again so assumed in our mind. It's deeply there at the level of assumption. That we are junkies, frantically, desperately wanting the nice sound, the nice smell, the nice taste, the nice person, the nice job, the nice view, the nice this, the nice next second. And it's like we're junkies constantly searching for that. Believing, of course, that that will come when I get that or that or that. That's the junkie mode. That's the way attachment works. And this too, like I'm saying, is at the level of assumption, very deep in the bones of our being and working spontaneously all the time, driving us. Attachment is what drives us from moment to moment. Attachment. And its function is, it has many functions. All these words we know so well. Expectation. Controlling. Completely the function of attachment. Or, or, you know, controlling, manipulating. Possessiveness when it comes to people and things. Huge possessing. You know, like this is mine. It's like it's me. It's like it's an extension of me. So microphones don't mind if you cling to them. People do. You know, microphones won't get hurt. People do. Attachment is sneaky as hell because also it looks like kindness. It looks like love. It looks good. So we con ourselves, you know. It's very wicked. Attachment is the sneakiest, most disgusting, wicked, wicked thing. I mean... Hear my words lightly, please. <laughs> I'm not trying to be fundamentalist here. 
but really it's real sneaky because we, we can dress it up to look really nice, meaning we mix it, we confuse it with good qualities. So we can make it look like kindness. We can make it look like we're really being helpful. We can make it look like taking care of somebody, compassion, love. We can make it look like that. We don't mean to, but it's its function. It's very sneaky and very hard to identify. That's when it comes to people, you know. So in relation to, you know, the me and the depression or whatever it might be, attachment, its job is to, um, is to have this, you know, to, is to be the assumption that something must be wrong if there's depression there. I, I must be bad. It is no good. It should not be this way. Do you see? We have that very deep, that assumption's very deep. This is wrong. It shouldn't be this way, we think. Well, it's not true. Who says? Sure, it's not happiness in the conventional sense. But the stronger we have the expectation and the assumption that it shouldn't be this way and I should feel good, then what do we do except beat ourselves up? This is bad. I'm bad. So all, all the different delusions, aversion, attachment, they all are playing, like I said, this perfect little role in making the whole of me walk through life, you know, in terms of suffering. So we've got to identify all the bits, you know, see, how they, see what their job is. So, of course, all these delusions of, of functioning alongside the virtuous ones. I mean, we, if we were just pure attachment and pure depression and pure jealousy, we would, we, we could, there wouldn't be such a person. There cannot be. Or they'd be pretty intense. You'd be a lion. You'd be a tiger. You'd be a really ruthless being who'd rip the guts out of buffaloes from breakfast, eat people's blood. You know, you'd be a vampire. So at least we can see, you know, we've got these parts of us and they're the ones we have to become familiar with because they're the source of our pain and the source of why we harm others, we have to identify them, know them deeply. But we have to acknowledge, you know, the, the virtuous qualities because they are the ones we need to develop, they are the ones we need to identify with because they are the ones that are at the core of our being. This is Buddha's deal. He says the positive qualities are actually at the core of our being. They are the ones we should be identifying with. But the, the trouble with ego is, which is all the junk, we, 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 we just don't even notice them. We don't give them any credibility. Someone says to you, oh, you're such a nice person, you're this and you're that. Yeah, come on. You know, you go back to the default mode of thinking you're a creep. I'm bad, I'm depressed, I'm no good. What, you know, we, we know we were desperate to hear those nice words again. We can't internalize them. We can't identify with them. We're hungry for the person to say you're a nice person again. But we don't know how to, what, to we can't take it as nourishment and we can't take it to begin to identify ourselves in that way. And that is what we must do. And why we can't is because we're addicted to the junk. Don't think it as being mean. It's just how it functions. The nature of the delusions is they're junky, like uh, addictive, habitual, habitual. We go to them. We go to them spontaneously. And you check. It doesn't take too much to make us angry, does it? Or jealous or hurt, low self-esteem. 27 people can tell you you're a good person. One just might intimate that you're not. Guess which one you go to like a magnet and make it as like a big novel, you know. I mean, this tells us something about ourself, doesn't it? And this is the point that Buddha's making about ego, is that that's the function of ego, as Lama Yeshi puts it, the self-pity me. I mean, we all recognize this. We've all heard this a million times in all the pop psychology, and from Jung and Freud and all the rest in various ways, but this is coming straight out of Buddha's mouth two and a half thousand years ago, okay? This monk. This is just an American, Australian way of talking Buddha's stuff, you know. Every word I'm saying here is not made up. I'm talking exactly Buddhist, accurately. If I'm not, you should throw me out. I'm being inauthentic. So Buddha's pretty cool, you know, how he talks, isn't it? So just to summarize, okay, we have this mind, consciousness. These words are used to mean the same thing. It's not physical. It's the name given to all your thoughts and feelings and emotions and unconscious, your personality, your characteristics. This is not your physical. It depends upon the physical, depends upon the brain. Clearly it does, but it's not the brain. It's not the body. Number two, it doesn't come from anyone else. And this is a fundamental one to really get our heads around 
It doesn't come from mummy, daddy or God, a creator. And it can't come from nothing. It's got its own continuity. And that whatever arises in it is, if you like, a fruit ripening from a seed you've planted in it way back when. Then the other thing we've talked about is the components of it. We can say there are positive, negative and neutral. Forget the neutral, we've got the positive and the negative. So the Buddha's view is the positive ones are realistic, are, 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 are spacious, are harmonious, are in the nature of peace, are in the nature of happiness and, and are at the core of our being. Who, they are who we really are. And that what's preventing us from identifying with that part of ourself, from being that, is the presence of the pollution, which doesn't belong, which is like additive. And that's the delusions. They're liars, misconceptions, they're in the nature of fear, they're painful, and they cause us to harm others. So the job then, this is what we're talking about here, this is the wisdom wing, the job then, from this point of view, is to identify the negative states of mind. So it's a bit like, that's why it can be a bit depressing to do this work because we can get so caught up in the negative and we feel like we're increasing our negative, we're like Buddha's rubbing our nose in it. But you know perfectly well, like I said, let's say there's a, some growth inside you, you've got to cut it and open it and look at it. You can't just pretend it's not there. And the, but when you know the reason you're looking at it, the reason you're identifying it is not to increase it, but it's so you can identify it, so you can get rid of it. So then you have, a, you, know, you have a perspective. So why you want to get in touch with your delusions is not to make yourself more miserable, is so you can recognize them, so you can go beyond them. So in other words, looking at your delusions is in the broader context of developing your potential. Then you've got courage to do it. So we, we easily fall into the fundamentalist mode and we get into spiritual paths. I shouldn't be angry and I shouldn't be depressed and I shouldn't be this and I shouldn't be that. Don't misunderstand, don't use that view wrongly. It's true, you shouldn't, but it is that it's there. So it sh of course it's true, the cancer shouldn't be there, if you like, in a conventional sense, but it is there, so we better get to know it so we can get rid of it. That's the attitude. Then you're courageous, then you're brave. So the, we've talked about those so far. And then the other, and one way we talked about is one of the simple attitudes or approaches, methods for dealing with what arises is that it's just the ripening of something that was there in the past and has little to do with what is arising in your life now. Therefore, not something to be identified with, but something to be seen for what it is and then learn to stay focused, identifying with the better part of yourself and keeping on with your life. And the, and the very doing of this lessens the daily pain of it and then eventually allows it to run out. But if you get depressed about the depression every day, you keep increasing the depression. So bad enough you get angry, let's say. Bad enough, it's old habit, it's okay. But identifying with it as I am this, I am that, that just increases the anger. You reinforce it and you grow it stronger. That's the irony of it. So we have to identify that it is real, it's right there. Look at the anger, look at how it harms me, look at how it harms others, but it ain't me. And this is a really important point, it's not the real me. And I mean, in that sense, it's, not, it's just the pollution. It's there. It causes suffering if you drink the water, but it's not the nature of the water. That's what gives you confidence that you can remove it. You're very cautious with it. If you don't drink that water, it'll kill you right now. But you can learn to get rid of it. And that's the attitude, which brings the long-term view, which brings patience and humility. So this is what we've talked about so far. Just a few distinct points. So why don't you ask me a couple of questions about that so far? You can be the gopher. Yep. The, uh, yes. Uh, the practice involves uh, the repetition of mantras. All this, yeah which I do, mm -hmm. and uh, the benefit of it really escapes me. I do it on faith because it's in a foreign language, and I'm, it's just a repetition of uh -huh. noises to me. Okay. Um, the sound. That's like your push-ups. You've not noticed any benefits yet? You haven't noticed that your mind maybe has become more relaxed, or you're a bit more kind, or maybe you see things a bit more clearly now, or you'll get over things more quickly. You've noticed no benefit in yourself at all. How long have you been doing all these little push-ups? Uh, well, I, in that case, I do notice benefit. Okay. Because there's the there burning in the muscles and... That's... The, 
Oh, uh -oh. okay. <laughs> Very the, good. The proof that, you know, people who do it, they start developing toward their goal. Uh -huh. But with mantras, it still just sounds. I okay, well, let's look at what just a sound means. Everything is only just something. There's nothing more to anything but other than this, this, that is just something. So let, let's say you did a mantra every day that said, I hate him, I will kill him, I hate him, I will kill him. Right? That's just sounds, isn't it? No. It is just sound. Hang on. It is just sounds, but you give it meaning. Yes. Okay. Mantra is just sounds, but there is meaning. That's all. That's all. Every, we give it meaning. The meaning is whatever the mantras are. So if you say, Om Mani Pemi Hung, the meaning is love and compassion. That's it. So you're identifying with love and compassion. Honey, there's guaranteed to be benefit. If you identify with, I want to kill you every day, there will be that result. That's a, that is exactly how it works. No more and no less. Because everything is only just that. Okay. Everything is a sound that we give meaning to. This is emptiness. You just hit it on the head. That's how things exist. Okay. Do you see the point? Yeah, when You're I resisting it though. What are you, what's going on? Keep talking. Well, yeah, when the old money paid me, um, I understand what it is. Yeah, then. But I don't have that understanding of all mantras. Oh. Well, then you just would, okay. So then I have to research it, I guess. And yeah, which, I mean, just don't want to get, go into your secret life of your practice, but another mantra, give an example of another mantra that you say that you like to say but you don't know the meaning of. Hmm. Well, okay, put it simply. If there is one you like to say, you don't know the meaning, will you check it out? Find out the meaning, that's all. That's up to you, isn't it? Yes. Hmm. Okay. Good. But, I mean, I'm not trying to be flippant here. It is, is that something helpful for your mind? Or you're still... I don't know. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. Of course you do, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Down the back there. Give it to John. Peter. John. Okay, go on then. Thank you. Yep. Hello, Venerable Rabin. Hello there, how are you? Nice to see you again. Yes. Um, so when you're practicing and you're trying to watch all the attraction and aversion that your mind creates, mm -hmm. or it almost seems like when you start that process, it gets worse. That's right, that's the point. Go and to the gym, the pain is <laughs> terrible. <laughs> Suddenly you feel like this monster. You see all That's the ways right. in which you're nasty to people it, or to exactly. animals or to this, oh, yes. that, and the other thing. That's right. Can you give any kind of advice just on how to buck up when you're going through this process? Yeah, what I've just been saying now. That yeah. that's, you, you, you know why you're doing it. You know that it's a symptom. You know that it's a sign of progress. Right. And, you, and, and that you're identifying with becoming Arnie, mm -hmm. not with the pain. So you're identifying with the development of your positive qualities. That's what I'm saying here. You learn to identify with the positive parts of yourself, which okay. are the parts you are trying to enhance by doing this work, which is bringing up the junk even more. But often we think it's getting worse, but actually we've just never noticed it before. That's all. Mm -hmm. So that's all. That attitude is simply the one. That is the attitude that we have to develop. Does it start getting any better? <laughs> you mean, does that attitude start to become more easy? Yes. <laughs> Practice makes perfect, doesn't okay. it? Yeah. Nothing gets difficult with familiarity. Nothing gets more okay. difficult with familiarity. So our habit now is to identify with the pain, with the bad, with the awful, I'm hopeless, I'm no good. That's the nature of ego, right? So right. that does just take time. So like everything, we have to practice thinking that. Buddha actually is an amazing cognitive therapist. Change the way we think. I, and I'm not joking here. I'm being deadly serious. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? It yes. does just take time. But we have to keep hearing it from others and hearing it in the teachings and then remind ourselves when it arises to think that. It just takes time. Yeah. So part of this, in other words, is you have got to, we've got to have the courage if you like, to bear the pain. I mean, if I think of some people, I always think of Lance Armstrong. I remember reading The New Yorker about the level of pain that he experienced in the pushing of his body, in the way he relentlessly pushes. It, was, it seemed almost unbearable. But obviously, he's really identifying with the cyclist, isn't he? And the, right. therefore, the, to that extent, has the courage to bear the pain because he sees there's a reason for the pain. 
So you just have to endure while it's going on and keep practicing. And The practice is the identifying with the good, the interpreting of the pain, not just the, the dull animal, you know, I don't mean just the ignorant bearing of it, but this interpretation of it, this new way of interpreting what is occurring in our daily life. This is what I'm talking about. Okay, thank that you. That takes time. It's like learning a foreign language, it's difficult. Yes. Do you see? It's cognitive, okay? Thank you. Okay, someone else. Okay, over here. Hello. Hi there. Um, I was thinking about something that we've talked about, that you've talked about when you were here um, in previous times. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that, that you stressed is that, you know, Buddha doesn't just say, take it on faith. He says, look at it for yourself and, right. and see if mm -hmm. that works for you. Absolutely. And in many ways, I've been able to do that um, mm -hmm. with looking at how my mind works. Mm -hmm. um, but I... But there are certain things that uh, Buddha teaches mm -hmm. that I can't really apprehend directly, maybe because sure. of my nature, the, the, the level of what That's I understand right, exactly. right now. That's right. So I guess the way I've been thinking about it and is that, well, if I've been able to look at mm -hmm. these other things mm -hmm. that I can apprehend right now and mm -hmm. see that they work, I suppose there must be then a certain element of, of faith. That's right. That yes. I must have exactly. Simply. Okay. Look at the word conf somebody pointed out to me last year, I think, the word confidence from the Latin confide with faith. Confidence in something means you've checked it out, you've to that extent it makes sense, and therefore you're 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 content to keep doing it. So you know, I can go to Einstein's classes and when he teaches me one and one is two, and even a bit more complicated, I'm cool. When he teaches me equals M C squared, I'm lost. But it, the same person in the same system, I'm prepared to give him the benefit of the doubt. If so much that he's, so I'm prepared to give the benefit of the doubt to this Buddha and to these lamas who've been teaching me. The stuff that they have told me that I have worked on, that I have verified, so far so good. Well, you know, that's pretty cool. So far I haven't found a major contradiction yet. So, you know, it's got to be based on that. It's reasonable. Everything's got a difficult level. But if you deal with it in a progressive way, your confidence builds up, doesn't it? So you're always the very, in fact, also to say this, the very function of practice Part of the function of practice is the process of verification. So when you listen to your math and you go home and you learn it, you're not just memorizing it. You're, 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 you're verifying it. And it's the verifying of it that gives you confidence. So we keep verifying, and that means experiencing it for ourselves. That is practice. As long as we do that and not just blindly cross your fingers and believe it, maybe you're suggesting that, perhaps. I don't know. What's your name? I don't know if I get your name. Uh, Myron. Myron. Myron, okay, so is that what you're sort of tending to say that you've not really verified it and checked it and you just are doing it on pure blind faith? Or are you really not only saying that? I don't think you're only saying no, that, I have Myron. Faith in it. So, okay, but faith and I the kind of confidence that I'm talking about here. A confidence that's based on some kind of wisdom, which is the confidence, the faith that we're talking about here. Is it? I guess I'm trying to reinforce my faith with. Uh, okay my understanding of things. Okay, I understand. No, that's exactly right. That is what faith is. It's confidence based on you verifying for yourself so far that what you're doing works for you, that the result comes. And even I could say, you know, I mean, even this much, you go to, let's say we go to someone goes to the Dalai Lama's teachings, have never heard him before, never heard of anything about Buddhism, but here's what he says, sort of watches him, observes him, listens to other people talk about him. That's good enough to have confidence in what he says, because you can see he's the proof of the pudding, to even some extent. So faith can even just be based on hearing a person who seems reasonable, who seems to be putting their money where their mouth is. That's good enough as a basis for confidence. But, and, but that, that's just a step, it keeps moving, it's not just stuck there, it's a progressive thing. That's what you're talking about, it's the same. So this is really the approach. But always, it's as long as we keep verifying it for ourselves, which is the experiencing of it for ourselves, then we will just progressively, naturally, pro naturally progress further. If it's just holding tight to the fact that one and one is two, and then even when you're 70, you think, oh yeah, one and one is two, because Miss Smith told me when I was five, yes, one and one is two. I don't know why, but I just believe it. Miss Smith told me. That's a bit fearful. And that's how we tend to think things. It's fearful. But when it's experiential, it's not fearful, because now it's yours. That's the point, with all of it. Whether it's MC squared or bicycle riding or this stuff, you know. And when we understand spiritual practice in these terms, which we do understand when it comes to math, 
then we will have sanity and we will really progress as human beings. This is the key. Makes sense, doesn't it, Myron? Yes. Okay. Someone else? What time are we having dinner? Lunch? Huh? It's funny, isn't dinner? In England, the working class would have dinner. We'd have dinner at lunchtime and, and tea at night. You'd have tea. Yeah, tea is, di tea is dinner. Yeah, we'd have that in Australia. You have to, oh, they do they? In the, south. in the south. Dinner in the middle of the day and then supper at night. Oh, there you go, the same. Mm -hmm. huh. Must have all been the English. It's like that thing in India called tiffin. I just love I don't know, what, what's tiffin? tiffin? What is that? It's 11 o'clock. You have a little, like a tea. And never heard of tiffin. All these years in India, oh, I've never heard of tiffin. Yeah. You're sure it's not all the British of the well, of Raj days? Yeah, of course. <laughs> but I was saying that it's some, it's some um, ashram in New Delhi and they said, Tiffin. Tiffin is at 11. Oh, my God. I'm rushed right over there to see what that was. <laughs> <laughs> so any more questions? Or should we carry on for a bit? Oh, lunch is at 12.30, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. So anything else you'd like to... Yeah, based on what we've talked so far. Microphone. Okay, go on. Yep. <coughs> Thank yep. you. Thank you okay. so much. Um, how, talk a little bit about the, uh, the use of the tool of a psychotherapist or psychotropic drugs when you're trying to take Buddhism on board and, you know, look okay, at your well mind. The bottom line in Buddhism also is, you know, is that you're trying to change your mind, which means understand it more deeply and change it. So therefore you could say anything that helps you achieve that can only be good. It can only be good. So whatever drug that you take that actually helps you, and this is the key point, that actually helps you understand your mind more, then how can it not be bad? How can it not be good? So if it is doing that, so we have to we have to work it out. Don't be fundamentalist about it. Some drugs can actually can just make us more miserable, can bring so many other side effects that it's not worth it in the end. So we have to, you know, make that. But I know many people, Buddhists, who take those anti you know, depression drugs, right? Because the depression, for whatever reason, karmic or whatever, is so overwhelming, so debilitating, right? You can't function. So then they, when they take their something, and, it, and you know, in Western terms, it, it lessens the chemical imbalance or whatever it does, which in, in Buddhist terms is very reasonable because the body and the mind are interconnected. So when your body, when, the, when the, those ba chemicals are, un, are more balanced, you then, your mind, which is not the chemicals, but the mind which is interacting with the body, can never have a bit more space to function. So you can be more reasonable. So then you can start seeing your mind more clearly and working on it. And eventually you might or might not give up the drugs because you've changed your depression. <coughs> so the crucial point here is the depression isn't the chemical imbalance, which of course is what we say in the West. But it's just the same when you go to your Tibetan doctor. He'll feel your pulses and he'll check, oh, oh, you got crazy winds there, Rabina. He'll say you got lung. It's the word for airs, and they talk in terms of earth, air, fire, water. So when you've got an imbalance of the, of the, of the wind energy or the imbalance of the elements, then, you know, the wind energy that is berserk, and so the various delusions that are related to those winds, in this case would be the one of anxiety and all that fear stuff, you know, then that, clearly, if your winds are calming down, then the delusions calm down. When, you, when, you, when, you're, um, when you've got a fever, your body's gone berserk, right? So you hallucinate, don't you? Your mind hallucinates because the body and the mind work together. So to do something to enable your body energies to calm down and function better just makes it easier for your mind to function. And then as a Buddhist, from that point, you then start to work on your mind by going in deeply, understanding the depression, seeing it clearly, or whatever, you know? So it's very, nothing wrong with that, perfectly reasonable. But again, the crucial thing is in how you understand it, how you interpret the depression or whatever it might be. Do you understand? I mean, exactly in the same way that you could say that let's say you've got a, very, a strong propensity to be angry and you notice that certain people, you know, activate that anger in you more than others. That's very reasonable. That's what happens. So for your own sake, you'd keep away from those people. In just the same way that if you have a strong, you know, attachment and the object is alcohol, we all know that you must remove yourself from the alcohol because then your attachment won't get activated so often. So you protect yourself. So you protect yourself because the body and the mind are separate. So the person out there and my addiction, the object out there called the alcohol and my attachment are not the same thing. The attachment is this tendency in my mind. The object is called the alcohol. 
the attach the anger is in my mind, the object, that person out there, they're separate. So be skillful and give yourself the appropriate physical conditions to enable your mind to work better. That's intelligence. But that's the way to interpret it in Buddhist terms. Not that the chemical imbalance is the depression, or that the alcohol is the cause of your suffering, or that the person who makes you angry is the cause. They're a catalyst. So that's the crucial point, to see it as a catalyst. Then it gives your mind space to do its thing and work better. That's a very intelligent thing to do. Well, not for the first time uh, when you were talking this morning, I was thinking that, um, oh, my thing is talking. If Your thing is that. talking? That yeah, you've right. noticed that. Talking is helpful? Uh, and, well, except telling a story over and over again, this is what I'm hearing again this morning, that telling a story about what, what you know, we make it real, we, we reify it, and I'm thinking that even in talk therapy, this can... What's talk therapy? Well, when you go in and you sit and chat with a therapist, and oh, this is how it's going on, and, and you sit there and you analyze it and stuff, and I could see where, I don't know, it seems to saying? me if the... If the therapist doesn't have a Buddhist point of view, you can be in therapy for years. No, okay, I don't think that's necessarily true. It's, it seems to me you can be a therapist who understands that the stuff that's going on inside you is yours, and that, that you could say that is Buddhist. Yeah. But I think any person who is a therapist who really has made changes in their own mind <coughs> and who really understands that you are you and they are they and there's a separateness there and that you've got potential to change your mind. Lots of therapists who aren't Buddhist understand that. You could say that is Buddhist. But lots of people who've done this job just to, uh, can only be a benefit to you. Of course they can. And so, yeah, of course. I mean, the extent to which you learn piano, of course, is dependent upon the extent of the, of the, of the skill of the teacher. And so if the therapist isn't very good and it's just, you know, of course you can, only go, you can only go that far and you will be therefore in therapy for 40 years. It's true. And there will be no progress. Exactly. That's a reflection on the therapist, I would say. I agree. Definitely. Yeah. Someone else? Or we'll carry on now. A little bit more. So I think the skill, the technique, if you like, because all the stuff we're talking about here can be applied is doable. So that the main tech, one of the techniques that we're discussing here that has come from so far what we've talked about is the one of knowing how to interpret your experiences. Just like when you're at the gym. I, I use such dumb examples because they're so necessary because we bring this stuff down to earth then. If you didn't know how to interpret the pain in your body when you go to the gym, you'd end up hurting yourself, wouldn't you? you'd end up thinking this is wrong, I shouldn't be going to the gym. You'd have all sorts of weird ideas about it. So then to know how to interpret what is arising in you is, is, is a very powerful practice itself. You know? So again, the context here is the, the development, what we're trying to do, the job, at ha the job in hand, the getting the ball in the hoop here is the developing of our per positive qualities. Call it finally nirvana, Buddhahood eventually, doesn't matter, just in general. The, the goal is the getting the ball in the hoop, the job is, you know, um, developing your positive qualities. Again, the analogy there is the developing of the, you know, the healthy body. So what is the obstacle right now is the presence of the too much fat and no muscle, the presence of the delusions. They are the obstacle. So going to the gym, you immediately activate the pain because you're activating that muscle. So here, you're activating, when you, start, when you attempt to work on your mind, you're activating the pain, you're activating the depression, the anger, the jealousy, the attachment, like crazy, you know. So it's, so the first interpretation is, it isn't true that it's getting worse, necessarily, it can't, not necessarily that. It is that you're now seeing it. But secondly, it can also be true that it is seeming to get worse. Another way to say that though, the right way to interpret it is it's, a, it's this seeds that were there for depression. Because you're practicing, your practice activates the ripening of those seeds and this huge depression or violent waves of anger or something, which your old habit, rise strongly. So a friend of mine, a monk, he was like a professional meditator for years meditating. And at one point, incredible, 
you know, anger and pride, his particular delusions. He was very distressed when he went to Lama Zopa. And Rinpoche kept saying, great, the dirt has to come out. The dirt has to come out. Great, the dirt has to come out. So just understanding just this, I tell you, can make a profound difference to you in your life. Because the fact of the matter is, until we've achieved nirvana, until we've completely cleaned ourselves up, there will be junk ripening all the time. There's lots of dirt to come out, countless lives of dirt in Buddhist terms. So we've got to have long-term patience, which is the other attitude that's crucial. Long-term patience. So already that's a profound attitude to develop. To have, you know, we're, on, we're in this for the long haul, you know. It's not quick fix. Long haul. Long-term long patience, his holiness said, you know. He said, I don't want to know about slow, patient, mindful. I want a man of action. Long-term patience. So keeping long-term goal, that's an attitude, isn't it? It's a way of seeing something. And then within that, recognizing the ripening of suffering and the ripening, and that can mean not just the depression, but also, the, you know, the lousy things in your life, the person leaving you, the car accident, the sickness. These are all symptoms. These are all dirt coming out. They're all symptoms of progress. They're all purification. This is a really huge... Under, to have this understanding makes a huge difference in your life. It's the difference between being pref more depressed or being happy. So, the, so another way to look at the attitude that we're discussing here is the very skillful attitude of not identifying with whatever goes wrong, which we have because of ignorance, but we have because of attachment. We're so attached to thinking that happiness is the nice guy, the nice this, the nice body, the nice sounds, the nice smell. So the second that that doesn't come, we're freaked out. That's called suffering. That's a misconception. Very simple. It's a misconception. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, the, it's the junkie mode. Happiness is when you get the fix and suffering is when you don't. So the attitude that a, the rising of suffering and of things going wrong is good isn't meant to be to make you kind of like addicted to suffering. On the contrary, it's understanding where it's coming from. And of course, we're talking the karmic thing here, which is Buddha's view. It's not just random. It's not meaningless. It's the ripening of junk, which is the seeds that you planted in your mind in the past. And thus, you know when a seed ripens, you've just finished that seed, haven't you? Every time the fruit comes, you've just finished that seed. So if it's a, if it's a lousy fruit, then you're glad. Wow, that's it. I remember this rabbi years ago talking in a conference I participated in in Florida uh, on the topic of why do bad things happen to good people. And he, they have the view of karma. He's a Kabbalah rabbi. They have the view of karma. I mean, obviously they don't call it that. That's Sanskrit. But he said they had, a, they had an attitude, he always had it from his mum and his family, that, you know, every time something bad happened, every time someone was mean to you, you think, great, one less debt to repay. That's the attitude here. It's an attitude. It's a way of interpreting. And everything comes down to interpreting, how, how you see it, how you call it, how you label it. This is exactly what Buddha's saying. This is exactly the point that Myron's making. Because this is relative reality. We, it's, it, we call it that. And, to that. and that's how things exist. In the way you name it, is what it is. How you, this is emptiness. How you label something is what it is for you. You label that person a creep, that is what truth is for you, isn't it? So if that is suffering for you, you call it suffering, self-existent, out there, real suffering, it will be suffering. But if you label it good, if you label it the ripening of your past seeds, what a load of junk, aren't I glad to get rid of it, the dirt coming out, you won't suffer. This is not meant to be kind of whimsical. This is applying dependent arising and emptiness. This is applying emptiness, this way of seeing. Way of seeing things is how Buddha says we make things. Myron's point. This is why Buddha would say mind comes, everything comes down to the mind. Everything comes down to, everything comes down to how we interpret things, how we label things. So we have pain, we have suffering, we have this. Things happen. It's called pain on a relative sense. But we have to learn to interpret it differently. <laughs> this is the skill. But because ego is absorbed in the old habits, we run like a magnet to the bad thing. And we say this is bad. And then self-pity me is rampant. 
We're absorbed in self-pity me. We want to hear it as bad. We want to tell it to other people. We cannot, because we cannot own it, we cannot hold it ourselves. It is bad, and we have to say it to someone, and we believe self-existently it is bad that I have this pain. It is real bad. No one understands how much I have to put up with. No one understands. The commonest thing we say is no one understands. You don't hear me. You don't understand. It's because we have not been able to hold that pain. We have not been able to have the courage to own it. We see it as self-existent bad. We identify ourselves with it. That's the way ego works. That's grasping at things as being self-existent. Out there, in and of itself, it is that. Buddha says, rubbish. Nothing can exist like that. Everything is how you label it. So as long as you keep labeling it bad, you're going to keep suffering, baby. But when you begin to label it as, you know, the dirt coming out, you begin to label it as, I'm glad this pain is coming. It's a sign of my progress. Look at Lance Armstrong. Then he is not suffering on those mountains because he's identifying with pure cyclist Lance Armstrong, which causes him to succeed. So seeing it as self-existent means believing it is that. That's the function of this ignorance. The deepest, most primordial function of ignorance is to see something is out there, it is that, and then we hold on to it, grasp at it as that. And even though 17 people can say, Rabina, you're not like that, it's okay, you're a good person, you don't believe it because you grasp at this is me, this is really bad. You don't understand, you're not hearing me, we'll say. We're not hearing it. We're not holding it. We're not bearing it. We are grasping at it as self-existent. It is real, we will say. This is real pain, real bad. This happens, that happens. So that's, that, at, that is an attitude. That is a way of seeing something. And that way of seeing something is the root of our suffering. Nothing has existence from its own side. Nothing exists in this way or that. Buddha says it can't exist if it were like this. Everything is only how we see it. We give it meaning. This is an outrageous concept, I tell you. It's mind-blowing. This is Buddha's greatest wisdom. This is the this view, this attitude, this way of seeing is the source of nirvana. Is the source of getting rid of suffering. This is the meaning of emptiness. Is what they mean when they say label it. We label it that. We call it that. We, we all agree conventionally that that is that. So then we give it this self existent thatness. We say it is that. It is suffering. And the more we say that, the less we are holding, bearing, owning our own experiences. Because self-pity me thinks it's done to me. Poor me. They did it to me. This pain does it to me. That thing, that depression, that this, that, that, whatever it is that we think is out there from its own side, it's doing it to me. Poor me. Poor me is what ego is. Nothing is done to us. We are seeing it that way. It is real and conventional sense insofar as it's that ripening of something. But then we label it something and we reinforce it by labeling it as self-existent, that. So the skill, it is ripening. That is a pain, that is a something, that is a hurt knee. Relatively, we label it that relatively. And it is, the, it is from grasping at something in the past, which is why it's now ripening. So the way to interpret it now is to is to see it as, or that's what it means, see it as empty, means we are calling it that. It doesn't have that meaning. It doesn't have that existence. We give it that existence. We label it that. We label it bad. 
You just have to call that pain good and you'll be like Lance Armstrong. Happy. I'm not joking here. This is the technique. But ego wants to see it as self-existent, wants to have, you know, ego is caught up in the self-pity me, that thing out there that is doing this to poor me, who doesn't deserve it. This is the voice of ego. So when we can label the pain differently, the suffering differently, we can achieve, like Lance Armstrong. I'm using him as a simple example. When we are overwhelmed by the pain, overwhelmed by the thing that's happening, we will sink and drown. But if we have the courage to see it as good, we will be perky and up and straight and keep on track, living our life, for achieving what we have to achieve. And no one else will even know we have suffering. You look at us now. We wear it. Talk about wear it on our sleeve. We wear everything all over us. Everything just by the way we carry ourselves, the way we talk, the way we walk. It's, we're naked to others because we can't hold what arises in us. We can't hold the pain. Emotional pain, physical pain, because we see it as self-existent. We see it as out there. We don't see it as something that we've created. We don't see it as, as merely labelled, as just conventionally. We give it that name. We identify with it. So it's obvious. And, and so, you know, we have to, we the, and, and we think, no one else understands me. No one else understands what I'm going through. No one understands how bad it is. No one understands how hard I work. It's because we have not owned it. Because we see it as separate from me. Poor me. This is happening to me. They're doing it to me. This is the voice of ego. The self-pity. This is how it talks. It's the hardest one, but this is the key. To, this attitude. Practice is changing the way you think. It's attitude. It's viewpoint. It's how you interpret things. So this is the, the most profound way to interpret things. This is applying emptiness. This is the key to happiness, the key to nirvana, the key to the ceasing of samsara, the key to ceasing suffering. Practice, finally, is in how you interpret things. Not joking, because that's how things exist conventionally. It's what it means, label. Merely labeled. That's what it means. That's what it means. We have to change the way we interpret everything. This is the key to sanity, the key to happiness, the key to nirvana, the key to enlightenment. This is what changing your mind means. So just keep the focus. Just just get a sense of the clarity of the, your mind, the spaciousness of this consciousness, spaciousness, clarity. A stepping stone to seeing the emptiness of the mind. Just think of your mind as this vast, spacious, clear, pure, expansive, like the sky, huge, spacious, clear, having no kind of characteristic, no shape, the way we give everything.
so we just finished this session just thinking so far so good you know whatever has made sense to us as we've listened each one of us the last couple of hours the seeds have gone in may they ripen in the development of our marvelous potential step by baby step for our sake and the sake of others and then just think of your lunch think of it as empty too it's how we call it Depression is how we label it, so lunch is the same. It's how you label it, how you name it. It's your attitude towards it. It's what your interpretation of it is. That's what gives it reality. There's no reality to the lunch other than what we give it. This is the shocking thing. So we think, this, the basis out there, you know, the this, the that, the bread, the soup, the vegetables, the salad, whatever. They're just things that we label that way that have become real for us, having an inherent meaning. So to see it is very spacious, and then imagine oceans of it, and then think of offering it to all the suffering beings on this earth, all the suffering humans, all those with incredible pain and depression and gross suffering, and all the suffering creatures, all the dogs and ants and fish and giraffes, all the suffering sentient beings throughout space. Imagine all of them experiencing the pleasure of these oceans of delicious food, giving them everything they need and taking away all their suffering, and offering it to all the holy beings, all those who have achieved perfection and are showing us how to do it. All of them experiencing the bliss of receiving this food. Lama Sangi Lama Cho, Dejin Lama Gedan Te, Kungi Je Pa Lama Te, Lama Nam La Cho Pa Bo. And then as Lama Zopa says, and I love to say it, once you've blessed the food and imagined offering it, the bigger your stomach the matter. Please enjoy. <laughs>